Brad Spielberger had tweeted out some defensive stats, not the director of E.T., is had tweeted out some defensive stats. He knows this too well. Right? Over the last couple of years where the Cowboys are the only team to rank top five in both seasons, and they did it in multiple categories. It was defensive uh, expected points per play, third last year, third the year before, and quarterback pressures, first this past season and fourth the year before. So you've now seen that the Cowboys have shown that they can replicate defense year over year. Because that was kind of the thing about like turnovers as well. You can't replicate turnovers. And the Cowboys still did a great job at forcing the other team to turn the ball over. So you've seen carryover from 21 to 22. And now I feel like we're all super optimistic about 2023. I might be most optimistic about the across the board strength of the defensive line, okay. not just the edge. What do you mean? What do you mean strength? Like the fact that Mozzie is really strong or just like you're talking about other things? No, no, no. Like literally right now, let's say, and this is going off. I, I realize defensive structure is going to change, but right now your first wave would theoretically, I think be Demarcus Lawrence, Mozzie, Osa, and Micah Parsons. Okay. Then your second wave would Which be amazing, by the way. Sam Williams, Jonathan Hankins, maybe Gallimore, and Dorrance Armstrong. I think all four of those guys could, I think Gallimore could play on another team. I think three of those guys could start on another, another team. team. And so I see, and then I know Bohanna's like pushing Hankins and Mozzie for playing time, and everybody was pretty excited about how he looked As and everything. they should, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, even look at the depth at left end you got Fowler that I mean like you're you're back to Fowler at your third behind yep. Armstrong and and Micah um and I I know this might sound weird but one of the people that we talked about with Broadus was Isaiah Lamb Isaiah Lamb Broadus is all and, about and so I I think that has led me just to be super pumped about the defense as, an, as a whole because we've talked a lot about the addition of Stefan Gilmore and how we already think that Trayvon Diggs is really good We've had conversations about Curse, Wilson, Hooker, the three-headed safety monster, and then depending on what you want to do with Mukwamu, is I felt good about that spot already, but I think this is the best I've felt about the depth and potential of the entire defensive line in, I don't know, a really long time. Yeah, I, I, I'm I very excited about it. I think the one thing, I think it's as well-constructed as it can be, Um I there's a lot of room for Mozzie to grow. I think Hankins will probably because he is the veteran uh, will probably get a lot. You'll see him a lot, um, but you also want to save his legs just a little bit. But you have an option behind him or in front of him right now, and that's something you really didn't have last year. If he wasn't in, you were struggling uh, to stop the run game. That's that was their biggest. You I mean that, your point is yes. that was their biggest problem was that I think Kevin I'm more interested in how they perform by season's end. Okay. Then right out of the gate. I think they're going to get pressure. I think this defense is going to get pressure from all different places. So much so that you're that everybody's getting excited that they're seeing in practice Leighton Van Der Esch blitzing. I think you're going to see overshone blitzing. And I think there's going to be lots more opportunities for these things that are, as Reggie points out, it's all about disguise in the NFL now. Uh, Reggie's talked about that at length, and man, if, sure. if you're listening to Reggie on the get right, you're really getting a good education on the stuff that he's looking up and learning right now. The but the, like his ability to put guys in different places, I think credits because of the defensive line, and that's where and and and. But I want Kevin because last year Micah's numbers slid late. Sure, Demarcus Lawrence's numbers slid late. A lot of these guys that started okay, we're kind of wearing down just a little bit late in the season. And and that goes to your point about, and this is somebody's fever dream that I do not think is completely far fetched. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but for the nine zero three on the passing downs, let's roll out Parsons, Lawrence inside, and Williams and Armstrong on the outside. Is one thing that we did hear and we did see out in training camp is you've seen more situational football with the more traditional edges going from the middle and like not occupying your typical defensive tackle. Like, no, they're still there mm -hmm. to hit the passer with a more aggressive up the middle scheme. So 
I, I do think, I'm not saying it's that exact lineup, but I do think it is going to be possible to see some of that interior movement, how people are hoping. Yeah. No, I, th- I think the, the dream, the dream scenario for Dan Quinn is we are so effective in our pass rush that there are balls floating in the air. Yep. And we have the guys that will take them right out of the air and turn it into an offensive, uh, a plus for us offensively. That, that's like his. Sounds fine. That's you want his. To say dr- touchdown. That's yeah. Fine. I think that's his, like his dream scenario. And, and I go back to there were a lot of Ravens teams that looked like it was relentless. It was aggressive. You could hardly breathe. You drop back, and all of a sudden, not just the outside edge is coming at your at your face. This is now the insides coming too. It's very it's it's exciting to watch when you're a fan of the team that has that. And the Cowboys put so much <laughs> emphasis on building and growing that over this time. I think Micah was the kind of wild card that they didn't expect to be that because I don't think I mean Dan Quinn really didn't expect him to be that his rookie season. He just found out because of injury that, that w- that's what it was. And then he said, we need to add to this. Now, I want to address one thing because this is just, it's not accurate. I-, I understand the perception, but this is just not accurate. From the 940, the first part I agree with. All depends on the run defense. They were still below average against the run even after adding Hankins last season. False. Is I realize for the season the Cowboys finished 22nd in rush defense, like yards against per game. I I understand that. I'm not disputing that whatsoever. But down the stretch, and when they got Hankins back, I know he ran into some injury problems as well. This run defense played way better. Now, way better than maybe the worst in the league. I know people might be arguing against, but like, In the last three games of the season, for example, they had the seventh best run defense in the NFL. And I realize three is a smaller sample size than we saw at the beginning of the season when you're like, oh, this is just a mess. But you saw glimpses when Hankins got here, when he was healthy, that this can be an average run defense at a time when we thought average would be amazing. Now, will some of these schematical shifts, will the addition of Mozzie Smith, will a healthy Jonathan Hankins, make it better than average. I think it's possible for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I think the, uh, Kevin, I, I think the linebacker additions make it better too, because I mean, you, it, you watch the game this past Saturday. Yep. What did you see whenever some of the big beefy defensive linemen held up their spots? Damone Clark, or I was going to say overshone, blowing somebody up. Yeah, exactly. Or just tackling them. I, you know what? Let me let me take a step back, Corey. I'm sorry. I, I get it. It's the more flashy play. But how many times last year were you desperate just to see a form tackle after two to three yards? Right. Like, so let's just say they tackled yes. them. Clark, overshone, even Cox towards the end, they, they were making tackles that you're like, good, that's a tackle you should make. Right. And, and you should make is the key word there because you're able to get there. There, there were times, and I know the Jalen Smith era is kind of long gone now, but there were, no, he's with the Saints there were times where going. he would block Leighton Vander Esch out of a play because yeah. he went to the wrong gap. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, like, these dudes that, like, Overshone can make an impact immediately coming out of Texas because, like, he knows how to play at a high level. And he's fast. And Mickey was talking about it. The one thing I'm concerned about, the one thing that, that does concern me is there were times that the the Atlanta Falcons looked light despite the fact that they had a lot of speed. I never felt like that Seattle Seahawks team looked light in any way. Like they always looked like they had the biggest, fastest, strongest dudes on the field when Dan Quinn was coaching those defenses. It always felt like the, the Atlanta Falcons were kind of wiry compared to what you had whenever you were dealing with Seattle. And that's what I want to stay away from is the uh, the, the, the light, just too many light players out there that are kind of like getting yeah, pushed around. Yeah. It doesn't seem like they have that. It seems like they have a lot of beef in front of them and a lot of speed to go in with impact in addition to it. But the, it looks like, and this is early. There's a lot of time to find out more about this. looks like these guys are going to create real lanes for these linebackers to do their job. I, this this might sound like a weird statement, but I think I'm most excited about the fact that when we make defensive cuts, I feel like a lot of teams in the league will be looking. Yes. Because well, they're like, what can that 
what can they bring us? And and you know what, man? Last year we were we were relying so heavily on, and it was because Clark had his surgery, but and and Jabril Cox wasn't up to speed yet. But we were relying on Anthony Barr, who looked lost at times. There were some games where Anthony Barr had good games. I'm not going to say there weren't, but there were a lot of times when I was like, he's not the same guy that he used to be. And playing opposite Le- Leighton Van Der Esch, it was a lot of um, stiffness as opposed to athleticism, being able to go make some plays whenever those things happen. It's also worth noting that it's kind of a different linebacker spot than he played when he was with the Vikings. Exactly. He played outside yeah, with e- the Vikings. Exactly. And so they were asking him to do a lot more when it came to his responsibilities and his body just physically was, wasn't used to it or ready for it or prepared for it. But you look at the body types of Clark and Overshone and these other guys that are going to be next to Leighton Van Der Esch, and you're a lot more confident that they're going to be able to get to those places, get to their spots, make the tackles that they're necessary.